Good evening. evening. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Father, we, we lift up this night to you, and we're always excited to be able to gather in your house, Lord, to worship together, to fellowship together, study your word together, Father. And we know, Lord, that, that your word, apart from the Holy Spirit, is, is just uh, it's not anything that we can see or understand. And so, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall on us tonight, that you would give us understanding, and that we would receive your word uh, in such a way, God, that we would be changed, that we would be molded into your image, and we would leave here, Father, with a greater intimacy with you and a greater knowledge of your word. And so, God, we lift up this night to you. We ask for your blessing your anointing to be upon us. We love you, Father, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's all turn in our Bibles to Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 14. Judges, chapter 14, as we continue our journey through God's Word. Israel has continued on this cycle of, of... being obedient for a while and and experiencing the blessings of God and then they go back to being disobedient and 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 rebelling uh, rebelling against God and and when we left off as a consequence of that rebellion uh, we saw where God had allowed Israel to be extremely oppressed by the Philistines uh, their arch enemy and they were oppressed by the Philistines for a period of 40 years and you remember last time how we were introduced to a godly man, a Danite by the name of Manoah, whose wife was barren. They had not been able to have children. But you remember how the angel of the Lord appeared to the wife of Manoah and told her that, in fact, she was going to uh, conceive and bear a son. And this son was to be a Nazarite from the womb, uh, meaning he was to never drink wine. He couldn't eat grapes or, or raisins. He was to never eat anything unclean. He was never to come in contact with a dead body. He was to never cut his hair or shave his beard. So his life was to be consecrated unto God because God was going to raise this child up as the next and perhaps the mightiest judge of all. Uh, in Israel. This was to be the one who was going to deliver Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. And we talked about last time how um, God had set Samson apart from all of humanity and had given him a very important, eternally significant calling upon his life. But because of Samson's lack of self-control and because of his love for the things of the world over the things of God, Samson is not going to accomplish anywhere near what he had the ability to accomplish uh, had Samson remained completely faithful in, in, in lining up his will and his heart with God's. Samson's greatest weakness, as we're going to see, is his appetite for the flesh, and particularly his appetite for women, and not just women, but worldly, ungodly women. What perfectly characterizes the life of, of Samson is we're going to see is he is a he man with a she problem. But let's jump in here uh, in, in chapter 13 or 14. The last verse of chapter 13 said, So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtaol. And so Samson is a young man now at this point. God is with him. God is blessing him. And it says, verse 1, Now Samson went down to Timnah, a place where he had no business being, uh, because Timnah is in the land of the Philistines. You and I, I guarantee you, most of our past failures can be traced back to us being in a place where we ought not be. And it says, while he was there, he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. And the very first action, the very first words that come out of Samson's mouth that are recorded for us in the Bible are going to be in defiance of God's word and God's plan for Samson's life. He saw a woman 
not among God's people, not among his people, a woman of the world, a pagan, that he was very attracted to. Now Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, and this is speaking of the inhabitants of Canaan. God says, and when you, when the Lord your God delivers you, or sorry, when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, speaking of the inhabitants of Canaan, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughters to their son, nor take their daughters for your son. In those days, all marriages were arranged by the parents, and, and, and even though God had said, you shall not intermarry with pagans, Samson didn't care. Here's a man who's not only a Jew, part of God's chosen people, he's a judge. He's a man who is sworn to uphold a Nazarite vow. He's a man who God literally set apart for the purpose of delivering Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. And now he's not just fraternizing with the enemy. He's seeking to become one of them. And so he went up, verse 2. Notice he didn't request or, or inquire of his parents. He went and told his father and mother, disrespecting and dishonoring them. He told them, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. And man, it was, it was love at first sight. Dad, you're not going to believe it. Red flag. Be careful. Now, I believe in love at first sight. If, and it's a big if, if God is involved. And God, he does that sometimes. But God will never be involved in putting someone in front of you for the purpose of pursuing a relationship with them if that other person is not already a member of God's own people. God loves you too much to ask you to be involved in missionary dating. And so we see the same thread being uh, woven throughout all of Scripture. In the Old Testament, it's you shall not intermarry. God was trying to preserve an uncompromised, undefiled bloodline that he had already promised was going to bring forth the Messiah. In the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he tells us why. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And, and in r relation to marriage, just like it is impossible for light and dark to occupy the same space, when you have one spouse who is a follower of Christ and the other one who is a follower of the world or a follower of anything else other than Christ, how do righteousness and lawlessness reside in the same home without there being a constant struggle related to how the home is governed? So God's trying to protect his children. He's trying to protect, protect Christians. He's trying to preserve uh, his church by warning his people to not become intimately involved with non-believers. And it's a warning that for whatever reason, just like Samson, a, a, a lot of believers, a lot of Christians just continue to ignore that warning today. I hear Christians say all the time, well, I just know that they'll get saved after we're married and that God's going to work it all out. So you're... you're, you're Asking and depending on God to work out something that God has already warned you in advance not to do. You see the, the irony in that? Clark says in his commentary, How can a Christian pray, lead me not into temptation, as they are plunging into temptation of their own accord? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go browsing through Victoria's Secret website, while at the same time praying, God protect my eyes and protect my heart. I'm going to walk right into a relationship with a non-believer while expecting and asking God to protect me against the consequences that, that usually accompany that sort of thing. It's a self-defeating way of, of thinking, even if I believe that I can be a strong influence on this other person's life. Because what is even more ironic is you can bet that that non-Christian 
fiancé on the other side of the coin, uh, they are saying and thinking the same thing that you are. They're, they're thinking that, they're gonna, you, that you're going to come around to their way of thinking after you get married, and that they'll be able to influence and draw you away from this whole born-again Christian thing. And sometimes, you know, they might actually become more influenced by you than you are them. Some, some do get saved. But statistically, it's overwhelmingly the other way around. So the reason that it is biblically wrong and it, it is a bad decision for a believer to marry a non-believer, at worst, it's going to lead you into a, a diminishing faith. At best, you're in for a long, hard life. And either way, it puts you in a marriage that doesn't even come close to fulfilling God's purpose for marriage, which no, no Christian wants you know, to be in, involved in. Now, some of you, uh, some of you might have gotten saved after you got married. And, and now you find yourself with an unbelieving spouse and, and the same challenges you know, of being in an, uh, in an unequally yoked marriage. What do you do? Well, Paul addresses that in great detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which we don't have the time to get into tonight, other than to say, uh, although having opposing views related to faith is a really good reason not to marry someone, uh, it's not a good or biblically legitimate reason to divorce them. So in that situation, you are to stay in the marriage and do the very best you can to shine the light of Jesus in, in that home. But Samson here, he's going to ignore the warning not to marry an unbelieving pagan. And, and he says to his parents, now therefore, get her for me as a wife. Go arrange the wedding. And his parents are going to try to reason with him and speak some truth into his life. And his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? In other words, you're going to marry from among uh, uh, people who do not have a covenant relationship with God? Do you really think that that is wise to, to go against what God has spoken and commanded in his word? Do you think it's wise to compromise and forever intimately link yourself with someone that belongs to the enemy? And Samson, in response to his parents' godly counsel, he said, you're right, Dad. You're right, Mom. What was I thinking? <laughs> no. He said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. More literally, that means she, she's right in my eyes. This, this looks right and this feels right to me. Again, no consideration related to how uh, this might look to God. So he's got no respect for his parents' authority and, and the God-given role that they were to play you know, in their son's uh, marital arrangements. But more importantly, he's got no respect for, for God's authority. And we're told, but his father and mother did not know that it was the, of the Lord that he, God, was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. And so is God endorsing it now? No. This is not God excusing Samson's sin and, and Samson's disobedience unto the word. Samson is going to experience a heavy consequence for, for his actions here. But, but this is God, as God is always able to somehow do, which is to take what you and I mean for evil and use it for his good purposes. As I said last time in chapter 13, most of what God is going to accomplish through Samson is going to be not because of Samson, but in spite of Samson. So God's going to use this whole Samson marrying a Philistine, and Samson's going to suffer the consequence of his sin, but God's going to use Samson's sin as an opportunity to bring judgment upon the Philistines, as it says, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now it's comforting to know that God can come and clean up my messes and, and you know, he, he's not going to let me get in his way related to his plan. And that, and that God can and does use our failures and our messes for his good purposes. I, I just wouldn't suggest personally getting too comfortable in that. I hear people say all the time, you know, God takes all my messes and makes messages out of them. And, and, and that's true. He does. But that 
That doesn't in any way excuse our sin, nor does it remove one ounce of the consequence that's going to come. Just know that God will always bring forth a, a better outcome for you through obedience than he will through disobedience. And you and I can avoid a whole lot of serious consequence and pain along the way if we allow God to work through obedience rather than him always having to work around our disobedience. And now we're going to get acquainted with just how much God had blessed and empowered Samson despite his disobedience. God only knows what Samson could have accomplished had he not uh, been so frivolous with his calling and his anointing. As we saw last week, it says Samson is going to begin to uh, remove the oppression of the Philistines. Uh, I, I fully believe that God had intended that he would settle that matter uh, once and for all, but God's going to have to call on uh, people later on, namely David, you know, to come along and actually uh, put away the, the Philistines once and for all. And so Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Again, what in the world would a person who is called to such a level of holiness that he's, stay, he's to stay far away from wine and that he's not even to come into contact with a grape. So what in the world is he doing walking through a vineyard? It's, it, it, it's like the recovering alcoholic going into the bar to order a Diet Coke. There, there, there is enough temptation that's going to come my way when I am walking the straight and narrow path. And so to be putting myself in places and situations where the temptation is going to be ramped up and, and magnified is just spiritual stupidity. The Bible says that we are to flee temptation. Samson just keeps inviting temptation. He keeps flirting with it. He keeps playing fast and loose with his walk by constantly situating himself in places that he should not be. And every single time that you and I find ourselves in a place where we ought not be, let me enlighten you who else will always be there with you lurking and prowling in the bushes ready to pounce. That roaring lion. That roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So Samson is walking along through a vineyard. And now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And, his, and, and as we see, even through his stupidity and spiritual carelessness, the grace of God comes along and intervenes. And it says, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And this is a picture of how we have the Holy Spirit power available to us in times of, of, of temptation, even when we've made a bad decision and find ourselves in a place where we ought not be. The Holy Spirit will always provide us with a means of escape and, and, and a way to slay the enemy who is before us if we want to. Now you and I, in and of, our, of ourselves, we are no match for the enemy, for that roaring lion. But the roaring lion is no match for the Holy Spirit if we, in times of trial and testing, will just hand the situation over to him and let him handle it. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one who would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, no weapon. I, I like the imagery. Like the Holy Spirit, here's this roaring lion. The Holy Spirit comes along and turns a roaring lion into a baby goat. But he did not tell his father, notice, or his mother what he had done. Why not? Well, we're going to see in a minute. He doesn't want them to know because he's not supposed to be handling a dead carcass. And that's what he's going to do. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson. Apparently, she, she was, he was impressed with her personality as much as he was her looks. And after some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. So the bees had built a nest in, in the carcass, or were making honey uh, in the carcass. And Samson noticed the honey. It says he took some of it in his hand and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave, them, he gave some to them, and they, all, they ate also. 
but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. What, what does that tell us about Samson's heart here? It tells us that he's not at all concerned with honoring his vow to God. He's only concerned with the appearance of honoring it and keeping it. Being a true Nazarite before God was not important to him, while the perception of at least appearing to be holy was. His consecration to God was, was superficial. It was external. And notice, this is important. Notice this. This, this. this is all happening despite the fact that we are told that he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Point being, being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't just automatically make a person godly. I've had people who, you know, are struggling with particular sin or, or whatever, and they'll come to me and they'll, they'll, want, they'll ask, you know, can you lay hands on me and can you pray that I'd be filled with the Holy Spirit? And of course, I'm, I'm more than glad to do that. But, but, but don't ever think that being filled with the Holy Spirit just magically makes you godly or holy without the participation of your will. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make you godly. Being filled with the Holy Spirit provides you with the resource to live godly. But there's still the element of your will that has to partner with the Holy Spirit and say yes and amen to whatever it is he's leading you and empowering you to overcome. And here's Samson filled with the Holy Spirit, but still completely being driven by uh, his flesh, governed by his fleshly desires. You know what? Who cares if walking through a vineyard is a bad idea? My flesh wants to walk through a vineyard. I'm walking through a vineyard. He wants a woman. He gets a woman. Who cares if God says no? My flesh says yes. He wants honey. He gets honey. Who cares if God says no? My flesh says yes. And besides, no one's going to know that I had to break my Nazarite vow in order to get it. So who cares? We see this life of hypocrisy and, and a complete disregard and flippancy toward his anointing. Samson's like, who cares about God's empowering and, and, and God's anointing? My flesh wants what it wants, and I'm, I'm going to make sure it gets what it wants, regardless of what God thinks. And then I'll just deal with the consequence. And eventually, and you know the story, you know how this ends. This kind of life always has a tragic ending. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there. For the young men used to do so. So he's going he's to marry this girl now. He's married. This is the wedding ceremony. He's not getting married according to the traditions of his people, God's people. He's not having a Jewish wedding. He's getting married the Philistine way. Among the Philistines. In the land of the Philistines. Among the enemies of Israel. And he throws this big feast as was the, the, the Philistine custom. In the original language, the translation is he, he threw a big drunken feast. And it doesn't say that he himself drank, but, but still you sit back and you think, what are you doing? And much like today, you, you, you throw a big party and you include free booze, you, you have people coming from all over. And that's what happens here, verse 11. It happened when they, the Philistines, saw him, that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Sort of like a, a, a bachelor party going on and then Samson said to them let me pose a riddle to you that's kind of what his life is all about I don't mean to be too hard on him I mean God used him but that's what his life is all about everything's a joke everything's a, a, a riddle he doesn't take anything seriously including his relationship with the Lord and so let me pose you a riddle and what begins as a friendly little wager here is going to eventually turn really ugly and, and violent Samson says, if you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, a wedding ceremony would, would last for seven days, and if you can solve the riddle by the end of the seven days, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of, of clothing. And, and he's talking about you know, fine apparel. In, in, this, this was a bet, you know, and the wager was for... 30 Armani suits, 30 Italian suits. If, if, you can, if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 uh, changes of clothing. 
And, and they said to him, you, you got to bet. So pose your riddle that we may hear it. So here's the riddle. He said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Anybody figure it out? He, he's talking about that dead lion carcass, right? Full of honey. Now for three days they could not explain the riddle, and, and they realized that they're about to lose this bet. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. And have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? So are you not in collaboration with Samson in this whole thing? I mean, you brought him here to make this bed and to, and to give us a riddle that no one can solve. And, and now you're causing us to get ripped off. He's going he's gonna to take our money. And, and, and by the way, if you're not in on it, then, then you better find a way to pry the answer of this riddle uh, from your husband. Uh, and if you don't, we're going to kill you. We're going we're to kill your whole family. And so, uh, as we're going to see, these guys weren't kidding around. They meant business. And then Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And so she's laying it on thick. You know, you can't keep secrets in a marriage, which is true. And he said to her, look, I have not explained it to my father or my mother. Nobody knows. I haven't even told my own parents. So should I explain it to you? And we're told, now she wept on him the seven days while their feast lasted. So she was inquiring and, and, and nagging him about the answer to the riddle from the very beginning, even before the Philistine men were you know, wanting to know and had, and had approached her. It happened on the, the seventh day that he told her, he told her the riddle because she pressed him so much. So he can overcome a lion with his bare hands, but he couldn't overcome the tears and the manipulation of a woman. And so he tells her the riddle, then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. Now, the fact that, that Samson's wife sided with her people over her husband, this stands in direct opposition to the way that God designed marriage. Mark chapter 10, verses 7 through 9, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So marriage done God's way, uh, a husband and wife are one. And, 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 and there's no one, not even parents or children, are to be given equal preeminence. In, in, in that marriage, in that relationship, God says we are to forsake all others and, and we are to leave and cleave, which again is the very reason that Samson should not have married a Philistine woman in the first place. How can you expect your spouse to operate in his or her uh, given role in, in a godly marriage if they don't believe in or so, serve your God in the first place? And you might say, well, yeah, but she acted out of, out of fear. Her life was, was being threatened, yes. But she's married to the strongest man in the world. She's married to a man who kills lions like they are baby goats. And I think she could have just leveled with Samson. She could have just told him what was going on with these men threatening her and her family. And I think Samson could have handled it. At the same time, Samson was wrong for keeping secrets. And there was a lack of trust on, on both parts because they are unequally yoked. And neither have sought to live out their marriage according to the designer and, and the creator of, of marriage and how he has ordained it. And so verse 18, the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, right before the deadline, these 30 Philistine men, they come to Samson, they let him know, that they have the answer to this, this riddle. And they, and they say, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And so they solved it. And he said, Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, 
you would not have solved my riddle. Now, I'm getting ready this week to start a premarital counseling with a young couple. And on the very first page of the premarital counseling handbook, it says right there, never refer to your wife as a heifer. <laughs> but what in essence, I mean, it's right there on the first page. What in essence Samson is saying you know, heifers don't plow. Oxen plow. And, and in other words, you, you didn't come to know the answer through natural intellectual means. You cheated. You did something uh, outside of the rules of uh, fair play. That's what he's saying here. Nevertheless, Samson uh, lost the bet, and now he's got to pay up. And here's what he's going to do uh, in order to pay up. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon, a neighboring Philistine city, and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave the changes of clothing to those who had, who had explained the riddle. Now, the Spirit of the Lord did not come upon Samson for the purpose of avenging Samson getting tricked and beaten at his own game. But remember, God had already ordained that he was going to use this whole situation to bring judgment upon the Philistines, and that's what he did. And so, you know, as far as Samson is concerned, he got revenge. He paid his debt to the Philistines, but it came at the expense of the Philistines, uh, uh, just as God intended it. But now, the fact that he did it in his own flesh, and his anger, and in revenge, and, and, and all, now he's going to pay the consequence for his uh, sin. So it says his anger was aroused. He was stirred up. He's still angry. And as a result, he didn't even go back to Timnah. It says he went back up to his father's house. So he didn't go through with the wedding. He left the heifer at the altar. <laughs> Samson's words, not mine. But then, rather than having the bride suffer the humiliation of being left at the altar, we're, we're told, verse 20, and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So the father of the bride, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We're going to suffer shame and humiliation on the whole family. And so he takes matters into his own hands. He saves his daughter and his family from humiliation. He salvages the wedding ceremony um, by giving his daughter over now to uh, the best man to marry him. And so chapter 15, after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, so some time has gone by, Samson cooled off, and he decided that he still loves this girl. And he still wants to marry her. He goes back to Timnah. As it says, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. So he goes back to Timnah, and he brings what's going to be needed now for a big feast. He's, he, he, he brought the main course and he's expecting to just, you know, pick right back up in the, in the wedding ceremony where they left off. And he said to her father, let me go into my wife, into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. And we're told why. Her father said, I really thought that, that you thoroughly hated her. I mean, you left her at the altar. You've been gone all this time. You called her a heifer. Therefore, I gave her... To your companion. I gave her to your best man. So she's already married to somebody else. And, and then the father offers an alternative. Now more than likely, Samson and Samson's family had paid a dowry, which is like, uh, you know, in those days, it's like premarital alimony, right? If you, if you, uh, you know, ever betrayed your wife or left your wife or whatever, she would have this dowry she, that she could now then uh, live uh, and be supported by um, in, your, in your absence for the rest of her life. And so apparently, it doesn't say, but we can, we can assume that, that, that Samson had paid a dowry for this girl, and so the father, what's he going to do? He can't give the money back. And he says, is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson's not interested in that offer at all. And uh, you know, he wants the one that he fell in love with and won her sister. And so again, his anger is kindled against all of the, the Philistines in general. And Samson said to them, this time, 
I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. In other words, what I'm about to do to you, you guys, you brought on yourself. I'm not going to be responsible for what I'm about to do. And then Samson went and caught 300 foxes. In the original language, the word for foxes is the same word that's used for jackals, which uh, is, is more than likely to be the case since it says he caught 300 and, and jackals are known to, to run in packs of, in, in the hundreds. Either way, it's an impressive feat. He caught 300 foxes or jackals or whatever and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And so he took two foxes, turned them back to back, tied their tails together so that when he released them, you know, they would just run aimlessly without any uh, sort of, of direction. So you've got a 150 pair of pairs, pair, 150 pairs, pair of foxes with, with their tails tied together. And then he lights their tails on fire. And it says, when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines. And here was the purpose of that. It says it burned up the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and olive groves. Now, we were told in verse 1 that it is the time of the harvest. And, and this is how Samson got his revenge upon the Philistines by burning their crops, their, their, their vineyards, their olive groves, uh, and, and he did it just as, you know, they're being harvested, just as it's, you know, it's all, uh, they've waited all this time and they've labored and, and uh, you know, now this is the time to cash in and um, now it's all gone. It's just some, something, he did something here that was just very, very devastating to their uh, economy. But don't feel too sorry for the Philistines. They're, they're about to do something far worse in retaliation. Then the Philistines said, who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his, his companion. And as it is with, with ungodly men, violence begets violence. And so the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. I mean, they probably just barricaded the house and the doors and the windows and lit the thing on fire and just burned them alive. And again, God was going to facilitate his plan of bringing down judgment upon the, the Philistines, whether Samson was obedient or not. But look at what his disobedience has caused. Just to point out, Samson could have avoided a lot of hurt and a lot of consequence simply by allowing to God work through him rather than working in, in spite of him. Samson said to them, since you would do a thing like this, I mean, he is horrified by, by what they've done, obviously very angry. He says, I will surely take revenge on you, and, and after that I will uh, cease. In, in other words, I'm about to unleash a fury on you guys like you have never seen, and I'm not going to stop until you have paid for what you've done. But again, is God in that? Who does vengeance belong to? Samson should have stopped. He should not have been controlled by his anger. He should have turned this whole thing over to the Lord and even said to the Philistines, I am going to let my God settle the score with you for what you've done. And God was obviously going to use Samson to exercise his judgment upon the Philistines anyway. It's the very purpose he was born. But here again, he's getting ahead of God. He's acting outside of God's will, God's heart. He's reacting totally out of the flesh rather than let, letting himself be directed and guided by the Spirit of God. And so it says he attacked them hip and thigh, which means you know, top to bottom, just up and down. The Philistines suffered Great casualties, as it says. He attacked them hip and thigh with great slaughter. And then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. Just Now he just goes off and just lives like a fugitive. It says, now the Philistines went up 
encamped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. Now remember at this time, Israel, they, they've been under subjection to the Philistines. I mean, the Philistines are ruling in, in that land and they had spent 40 years being ruled and governed and, and under subjection to the Philistines. And so uh, having an Israelite now, Samson, fighting against and killing Philistines, they see that as a declaration of war. They see that as a pushback or a resisting of uh, their, their uh, authority over Israel. And so the Philistines come with their army, and here they are encamped in Judah, and the people of Judah are like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's going on? Why are you encamped against us? And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And so they answered, we have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Now, God had raised up Samson as the judge. God had raised up many judges, up, you know, at this point in Israel's history. And God raised Samson up to be their deliverer. But Judah, rather than getting behind the uh, deliverer that God had sent them, and, and knowing without a doubt how much, just how much God had empowered Samson, evidenced by the fact that they're going to go arrest him, they're going to send 3,000 men to just arrest this, this one guy. Well, they know how powerful he is. They know that he's sent by God. But rather than getting on board and inquiring about what God might be doing in and through Samson, what God might be doing for Israel through Samson, here they are not only trying to thwart God's deliverance, to thwart what God might be doing, they're going out of their way now to appease their oppressors. They're going out of their way to appease the enemy. It says, Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? So they're more upset about the fact that someone stood up to evil than they are the evil itself. Now, in defense of Israel, if there is a defense, Samson didn't exactly organize an, an, an Israeli army and, and involve the rest of Israel in, in attempting to go and to overthrow you know, the oppression of the Philistines. He went around fighting the Lord's battles as if they were his own private feuds. But still, Israel should have recognized that their battle is not with Samson. Samson is not the enemy. The Philistines are. It's like you see the videos on, on, on YouTube and these people protesting at Planned Parenthood. They're just out there carrying signs and they're peaceful. And they're just out there praying. And the people that are praying are having profanities shouted at them. They're just out there trying to defend the innocent. And, and, and then you have this rage, you know, that comes against that kind of thing. And you just want to say, wait, you're, you're angry with me? You're angry with my sign? You're angry with what's going on out here on the sidewalk? And, 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 and you're okay with what's going on inside? See, we, 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 we've gotten things so backwards in our culture and our society the men of Judah inquire of Samson. They're like, why are you standing up to evil? I mean, who told you? Who, 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 who of us made you boss? Why are you not submitting to oppression just like the rest of us? Why are you not submitting to fear just like the rest of us? Why are you provoking the enemy instead of appeasing the enemy like the rest of us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. They got what they deserved. But they said to him, all right, we have come. We've come down to arrest you that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. 
So this is it, man. This is where it all stops. We've come to put an end. We've come to put a stop to your protest of evil. We don't want to hear it anymore. Put your mask on. Then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. I don't want to die at the hands of my own countrymen. And so they spoke to him saying, No, we're not going to kill you. But we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand. But we will surely not kill you. Now Samson is submitting to all this, of course. He's, he's, he's submitting willfully, because as we're going to see, this is all part of a plan. It's all part of a plan that's going to facilitate him being able to kill many, many more Philistines. And so they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. You can imagine, here, here he is, right? We've been we've wanting to get our hands on this guy for so long. They're so excited about the fact that now here he is and he's being delivered to us by his own people bound by ropes. But we're told, then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Uh-oh. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He just snapped those ropes like they were spaghetti. And he looked and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Who was it, Shem Shemgar, that killed 600? The Philistines at this time would have had superior weaponry. I mean, spears and shields and armor and, you know, a thousand guys well armored coming at, at, at Samson. Here's Samson. The first thing he finds, he finds the jawbone of a donkey. That's his weapon, an animal bone. But that animal bone is like an F-14 Tomcat in the hands of the Holy Spirit. One man against a thousand, and at the end of it all, the one man is still standing and the thousand are dead because that one man was mightily filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And it doesn't say, but I've often wondered here when I read this, what the, the 3,000 Jewish men who turned Samson over to the Philistines thought when they saw all of this go down. I mean, they had to have been a little bit nervous and changing their tune a little bit. You know, go Samson! Yeah! Good job, brother! <laughs> then Samson said, he, he's going to toot his own horn here, which God's going to notice. With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. And so it was, when he had finished speaking, that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi, which literally means jawbone hill or, or jawbone heights. And then he became very thirsty, notice. And, and like thirsty to the point of death. And, and God lets that happen because it's a great reminder of no matter who man is or no matter what man has done on this earth, every man is utterly and completely dependent upon God. You might say, I have done this, I have done that. Be careful. Lest God has to come along and emphatically remind you that you didn't do anything. As I said on Sunday, every breath that God allows us to take in this world is an incredible act of mercy on God's part. And Samson's great thirst is going to remind Samson of just that. And it's even going to cause Samson now to come to just kind of reverse and, and now give credit where credit is due related to the slaying of the thousand Philistine soldiers. So many times in, in, in our lives and all throughout Scripture, and you can attest to this, I'm sure, but what immediately 
follows great victories in our lives are great tests. No sooner did Israel cross the Red Sea. Man, they're celebrating, they're praising God. No sooner they crossed the Red Sea than they became thirsty and hungry. And there they are crying out to the Lord. Elijah's victory over the prophets of Baal on, on Mount Carmel. That was immediately followed up by him on the run from, from Queen Jezebel because she'd put a hit out on his life. And there he was, fearing for his life, hungry, thirsty, crying out to God. He just had this unbelievably, incredibly supernatural victory over all of these hundreds of prophets. Slayed them all. Because God knows if our victories aren't perfectly balanced with tests, we like the victories and we don't like the tests. But if God doesn't perfectly balance those things in our lives, then we as humans, we are going to end up robbing God of part or even all of his glory. And he knows it. We're going to end up with a false, unwarranted confidence in ourselves and we're going to end up with a very inadequate dependency upon God. And so we need to be thankful that God is a God who, who balances those things out in our lives. And interestingly enough for Samson, this is, this is going to be the first of only two prayers that are recorded for us in the entire 20 years of Samson's judgeship over Israel. So he's thirsty, he's about to die of thirst, so he cried out to the Lord and said, notice, you have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. Not I anymore, you. But what, is it, what good is it going to do, God, if I die of thirst now? And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? And, and, and God's going to hear, God's going to honor his prayer. And so God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned, and he revived, and therefore he called its name in Hakore, which just, just means the well of him who cried, which is in uh, Lehi, it says, to this day. So he went from praising himself to praising God really, really quickly. God has a way of making us do that when we seek to take any credit uh, for the victory to claim any part of his glory in our lives. And he, Samson, judged Israel 20 years in the days of the, the, the Philistines. And we'll pick up our study in chapter 16 next time where it, it begins to lay out for us that the, you know, Delilah and the ultimate downfall of Samson. Let's pray. Father, you are awesome and, and mighty and holy. You are the creator of heaven and earth and all that is in them. We are your creation, Lord, created to praise you. We praise you tonight. We lift up our voices, we lift up our hearts, Lord, and hopefully everybody in this room has lifted up their lives to you. And that our lives might be that shining example of your truth and your goodness and your mercy bestowed upon humanity. Help us to walk in your grace, God. Help us to walk in your goodness. Help us to praise you. Help us to be obedient unto your word. Use us, Lord. Use us in mighty ways, as you did, Samson. But may it be, Lord, that we are used according to obedience rather than disobedience, and that we're working with you, Lord, in partnership with you and your spirit, rather than your spirit having to work around us, our flesh, our worldly desires work around our disobedience unto you. And so, Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh. Be with us this night. Bless our families. Bless marriages. Bless this church. Bless this community. And help us, God, to be a bright light. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never accepted the Lord, if you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you after service uh, this Sunday. We're going to pick up our study in, in uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 6. And so we'll go ahead and be reading forward on that. If you'll all stand with me, we will close. I love you, Lord, 
And I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. God bless you all.